And thank you, so, thank you so much for the introduction and for the opportunity to speak to the audience. Uh, my name is Seiya Matsumoto. And actually, uh, my colleague, Mr. Oliver Pust, uh, has planned to join this uh, prayer fair, but uh, he's sick now. So um, I will talk about technologies, applications, and answer the question, um, is optical filters a commodity uh, on behalf of Mr. Oliver Pust? So oh, in this presentation, I will try to convince you about that optical filters are not a commodity. Um, here is the content of my presentation. I will tell you uh, what I understand uh, with optical filtering, define filter types by their functionality, and explain the principles how optical <coughs> filter can take place. I will share some market observations with you and then dive into with thin film filter production technologies. In that context, um, Cabal's uh, choice of substrate for thin film filters, the impact of large angle of incidence, and ex uh, explain some cost drivers in filter production. As for last topic, I will show you um, some applications of colored glass filters. So um, what is optical filtering? Optical filtering take, takes place when we talk about the part of the electromagnetic spectrum that deals with either violet to the uh, mid infrared. The basic functionality of an optical filter is to transmit one part of the spectrum and to block or reflect another part of the spectrum. From my point of view, a good optical uh, measurement always starts with high-performance optical filter. I share some experience about uh, requests that uh, Mr. Puss, my crack, received through the past years. So um, believe it or not, um, he received a request for coffee filter. It's one of the most used filters, but definitely not an optical filter. Once in a while, he received a request for mechanical filters. Also, uh, these are important, but again, not our topic. And more often, he receives a request for uh, the electric electrical filters. While these are certainly very interesting, but uh, we, do not talk, uh, we do not want to talk about them. So um, here we have the optical filters in different shapes and functionality. That is what we want to talk about. But uh, you already see when you uh, receive this uh, off the mark question, uh, request, there are some people who consider filters a commodity. The filter types uh, by their functionality can be divided into short wave pass filters. This transmit the shorter wavelengths of the spectrum while they block the uh, longer wavelengths. When you are an electric, electrical engineer, you may know uh, them as high-pass frequency filters. Then we have the opposite wavelength pass filters that transmit the uh, longer wavelengths and blocks the shorter wavelengths. Again, um, electrical engineers use uh, different terminology low pass frequency filter. Then uh, we have band pass filters, which transmit more or less a narrow band of the spectrum by blocking the shorter and the longer wavelengths. And the opposite of band pass filter would be a notch filter that blocks narrow band while transmitting uh, the shorter and the longer wavelengths. Then uh, we have the dichroic filters. These are available as uh, short wave length pass filters and as long wave pass filters. They transmit either the shorter wave length and reflect the longer wave length, or transmit the longer wave length and reflect the shorter wave length. Uh, very often, and they are optimized for angle of incidence of 45 degrees and are used as dichroic beam splitters. And there are several ways uh, of how you can achieve optical filtering. 
you have the recent SynFilm features that based on the effect of constructive and de destructive interference. There is uh, another technology that is used for the mass produce the kind of filter arrays in every color camera. These are uh, um, inorganic pigments and organic dyes on the uh, plastic substrate. You can use liquid crystal filters, and they are based on the principle of bioregions uh, in the liquid to crystals. The last option is to use a coarse optic uh, filters. They are based on diffraction, uh, which is based on the photoelasticity effect. When a uh, radio frequency source induces density vari uh, variations in an optical crystals. But today, we only want to talk about the first two types of filters, which are most widely used, uh, colored glass filters and thin film filters. So uh, what is the difference? Uh, what are the characteristics between uh, colored glass filters and thin film filters? The first type is based on absorption. Um, the blocking is based on the absorption, which has uh, the nice effect that uh, all the light which you do not want to have your uh, instruments is absorbed in the filter. That reduces the stray light level quite a lot in your instrument. And downside is uh, you have limited choice of the wavelengths uh, because you have the chemical elements uh, which are available in the periodic system. You cannot design in every filter functionality, but you still um, have a reasonable choice of wavelengths. And um, one major benefit is that this absorption effect is not sensitive to angle of incidence. So uh, the, the filters do not have any angular sensitivity. They have moderate and um, environmentally stability, but the, uh, uh, the other hand, uh, when you have scratches on the card filters, these scratches are merely cosmetic. Then, and thin film filters are based on the interference, and if you want to block the wavelength range, um, it is done by constructive interference. But that means all um, undesired light in your instruments will be reflected back into the instrument and needs to be uh, handled down somewhere. You definitely need to um, care much more about stray light with thin film filters. And an advantage is that they can, in theory, uh, be freely designed. Of course, not um, everything can be produced, but you can design every filter functionality that you can imagine. It comes but at the price of the high, very high angular sensitivity. An advantage is they have, which uh, with modern production technologies and environmental stability, but because these are thin films on the glass substrate, the scratches uh, that you might have on filter will degrade their spectrum characteristics. So uh, what is also possible is that you cut on colored filters, and that can be uh, for many applications an ideal combination and of both benefits from uh, both worlds. Um, I share some market observations uh, that are made through the past years since I deal with optical filters. What I observed is that the market experience is polarization like many societies. So uh, the middle class drops out, and the same is true for the filter technology. There is uh, one application uh, where you need inexpensive standard filters for high volume applications. You can see an example um, where you have limited transmission and the blocking is not as deep as it could be, where length length is not very big and the edge are not very steep. On the other hand, you have uh, very complex filters for high-end applications, which, of uh, course, have a higher price. But uh, they are suited for the most demanding applications uh, with very high transmission levels, very steep edges, and very deep blocking over an extended wavelength range. 
some more observations, you can see that the filters are often overlooked in many customers. But um, in fact, they are a crucial component of the optical instrument. Because um, if you think about it, uh, when optical instruments need to take a measurement, it always starts with um, the optical filter in the path of the light. So definitely, they need to be considered. I also saw uh, that the contact from the customer happens later in the de development stage. Um, because uh, people first design the instrument and they inform themselves uh, about optical filters on the internet. Only come to you at a late stage when, you, when the instrument is more or less ready. Um, it often turns out that the uh, filter cannot be designed or it can only be produced at prohibitive cost, which should be avoided. Um, there are uh, more and more companies that do not really have optical specialists. Uh, for example, uh, small startups or uh, companies dealing with LiDAR. In such case, uh, mechanical or electrical engineers are tasked with optics. This can, uh, this can make the things difficult too. Um, another situation could be the request for the quotation comes through the purchasing member and the access to the technical stuff is very limited or uh, restricted due to the internal reasons. This makes it challenging to propose a solution that is both application specific and cost effective at the same time. If you cannot discuss about technical specification with the engineers in the background, it makes it very difficult. So um, this slide shows some of the filter production technologies for thin film filters in the early years. Last century, uh, soft coatings were used, and they are more uh, they are made from thin sulfide and cry cryolite, and more often contain thin metal layers like silver. Very often, they are glued together uh, from many substrates to achieve overall filter performance. They typically have poor environmental durability and poor temperature stability. The transmission blocking levels are quite low because of the high optical scatter. On the positive side is that you have low production costs and low bending of the substrate. So um, it's still an option that you have in the market you need to make sure what type of the production technology your filter manufacturer uses. Then, and later, traditional hard coatings came into the existence. They are produced with a plasma-assisted vacuum deposition process with uh, metal oxides. Modern equipment is computer-controlled, and you can deposit a higher number of layers, form, or complexity of the filter functionality. They are also environmentally more stable, but still may contain uh, some voids uh, that absorb water vapor. With the water vapor, the refractive index will change, and uh, this will occur the spectral shift. So you also need to consider that um, when you are looking at the uh, filter nowadays. The most modern filter since 10 to uh, 15 years, what we would call ultra-hard uh, coatings, they are produced with IBS or magnetron sputtering or APS process and that generates very dense and amorphous coatings. These have a very high durability and stability. No protection is needed for these filters, and you can produce very complex filter designs with several hundred layers nowadays. So we have recently seen um, advanced filters with 300 layers on each side, which was not possible just several years ago. But that counts, of course, at the cost. The high energy plasma or iron beam induces mechanical stress um, in the coating, which leads to bending of the substrate. The thinner the substrate becomes, uh, the more severe bending is. 
another thing uh, to consider is that these filters um, have higher costs and for the customer, initially, higher investment. However, um, you still might see that the cost of ownership is reduced because um, these filters last longer and do not lead to um, any degradation over time and the bad customer experience. Um, the more complex the filters become, the more important the choice of the substrate. For many years, the standard and the still is uh, mechanically polished glass. They can be uh, BK7 or equivalent of fusel silica or many other glasses. The advantage that you can have them in virtually any thickness, but you might see that it's not always possible to remove all polishing residuals, and which can create a, a problem for the growth of the thin layers on the substrate. Of course, um, companies try to optimize production times, so they tend to use high-speed polishing, which might cause micro cracks on the surface. So um, in the recent years, filter companies looked at fire-polished glass or float glass, float glass uh, like uh, D263, B270, or blow float glass. There are uh, no polishing residuals uh, necessary, or they do not occur. One drawback is uh, that, for example, D263 is only available in 1.1 millimeter thickness as a maximum. And as I expand, um, these modern coatings thicker becomes the more stressed. Um, people are looking for alternatives which could be uh, ball fraud. Uh, which you can get at one inch maximum, um, but you have to consider that um, due to the production process as a float glass, uh, the one side of the substrate is in contact with liquid tin. And polishing might be necessary to remove this tin. One possible solution that Hoya can offer is high precision polished glass. The advantage is that it can be polished from virtually any of the known materials, and the surface quality as to surface roughness can even be better than float glass D263. As you can see in the two plots on the left-hand side, we have the fire polished glass, and on, on the right-hand side, we have the high precision polished glass substrate. Here, um, the advantage again is that you can have the surface quality of fire, uh, fire polished glass with the thickness of any standard materials, which can be larger than 1.1 millimeter to avoid the bending of substrate. Thin film interference filters have natural property, uh, which is sensitivity to angle of incidence. The spectral uh, properties will shift towards shorter wavelengths because of the path length of the optic array it changes in the filter. So you can see on the left-hand side plot for 0, 10, and 30, and 45 degrees angle of incidence. And from the formula below, you can see the blue shift, which uh, rarely becomes severe beyond 10 degrees. For example, at 10 degrees, you only have 2 nanometer shift, but at 45 degrees, you already have 40, uh, 40 nanometer shift. And this shift itself depends on the material. It is uh, tied to effective refractive index, and it also depends on the polarization. Uh, what is uh, not showing in this slide is uh, that also the blocking can be impacted. You will, uh, you will see reduced blocking and sometimes spikes in the blocking area. So angle of incidence is something to seriously consider for thin film filters. For uh, laboratory instruments, which are big, like a fluorescent microscope, the situation typically is that your vehicle collimated light uh, with small cone half angles and you have a dichroic beam splitter that aids with uh, uh, blocking. 
Um, when you use the use a uh, microscope for observation with a human eye, you only need limited blocking wave wavelength range. The uh, whole instrument is designed for a low stray, stray light level. What we recent, uh, recently see is that the same fluorescence technology is used in the smaller instrument, like uh, point of care devices, which have been especially failed uh, by the corona pandemic for the uh, corona quick testing in instrument. These compact instruments, you have large cone half angles, and you can't use uh, the dichroic beam splitter because you need an extended wavelength range for your silicon-based detectors because uh, beam splitter is missing. Higher OD value is in the excitation. And because, because of the compact design, it's not very easy to control the stray light level. So uh, that is definitely much more challenging to make uh, good filters for very, com very compact instrument. Um, I, was, I also want to make you aware of the most important cost drivers in thin film filter production. Most important points are the blocking level and the blocking wavelength range. It's very easy when you want to have higher and wider blocking. Uh, you need more uh, coating layers that takes longer coating time, and this means higher price. But also tolerances um, influence the unit price too. And tight tolerances make the yield lower and lead higher unit price. And I have a preach or an advice to you. Um, please set, uh, specify your tolerances and percent, percentage of the center wavelengths or band widths. Do not give absolute values because when you look at uh, plus minus 2 nanometer at 400 nanometer, that is much easier to achieve than plus minus 2 nanometer at 800 nanometers. So if you design your instruments for certain tolerance at certain wavelengths, express that as a percentage of that wavelength. It makes much easier to fulfill uh, that than for the complete wavelength range. Also, very strict um, visual specification can incur higher cost because the yield will be lower. And uh, one thing I also recommend is to specify your visual uh, specification according to the ISO standard, not to the specification um, uh, according to the uh, scratch and dig standard. Scratch and dig is a subjective comparison with different standards, and different people might come to the different result. ISO standard measurements with an instrument that can easily be compared across different vendors or companies. At last, not least, and do not over specify your optical uh, to the filter manufacturer. And please leave that, uh, if you want to have the s some safety margin, and please leave that to the filter manufacturer, because they need to take care of the safety margin in their production uh, process anyway. If both of you uh, put safety margin on it, this filter will be unnecessarily uh, complex and expensive. Um, at the last topic, I want to uh, mention some typical applications and advantages of colored glass filters. In consumer optics, they are very often used as a heat absorption filters or heat protection filters, like uh, in copying machines or projectors, in any steel or video cameras. You will find a colored glass filter to match the sensitivity of the sensor to the human eye response. A very known application is the colored glass filter as IR cut filter to remove the IR from the sensor to give the correct color impression. In industrial equipment, it's used for, let's say, airport lighting for many sensor applications, uh, for example, barcode readers. So typical applications are where the angular insensitivity is important. There are many applications where you want to have UV 
uh, for example, bank code identification, fingerprint detection, or UV excitation for creating visible luminescence. As you might know, um, it's very difficult to get symphony interference filters below 300 nanometer. There are uh, some filters for colored glasses uh, that can achieve this wavelength range. Again, um, IR cut filters are also a standard application for these types of filters. They are also found in medical and biotech applications, mostly for surgical lighting to give the correct color impression to the surgeon, dental lighting for sterilization equipment with UV light sources, for hair removal instruments very often use colored glass filters, and decreasing popularity of fluorescence microscopy. Then uh, we have applications in the field of laser safety. For example, where you find laser protection girders or uh, larger windows in cabins and curtains. Here again, it's very important that you do not have any angular sensitivity. Because um, if you have a laser beam at an angle, it might just go through in thin film, thin film interference filters. And that can not happen with colored glass filters. So here is uh, very advantageous to use colored glass over thin film filters. Then we have a large area of automotive applications. When cars become more intelligent, they use more and more optical sensors, like for lidars or artificial, artificial intelligence based on cameras. Very often, this works with infrared radiation and have very large angle of incidence in opening angles. In infrared uh, filters, which are based on color glass filters, are very helpful in the design. So maybe it's a time. OK, yeah. <laughs> one, one, and one of these fi uh, filters are colored glass called RM, RM100. And it can achieve very high transmission, about 95% if you apply double side air coating on it, to it. This has very deep blocking and the complete visible level wavelength range. And that makes the, this filter totally unreflective and getting very deep color appearance which is also very nice compared to thin film filter. And so I mentioned that UV filters are very interesting in many applications for up, uh, below 300 nanometers. And um, this can up to uh, three, three, uh, 65 nanometer wavelength range. So to summarize my presentation, filters are complex and high performance optical components. And I hope I could convince you that they are not commodity. And uh, yeah, I'm le um, I will be available at my uh, booth uh, D7B uh, after this presentation. And uh, thank you very much for attention. Um, thank you, Seiya, for this uh, interesting presentation. Is there maybe room for one quick question? No question. I just one quick question. I yeah. s you said that you, uh, you know, have to design those things in the process already, mm -hmm. uh, very early. Do you also do co-development, or you do do you have off-the-shelf products only? Um, if our customer wants to uh, collaborate with us, then we can support uh, from the development and the very early development stage. How can um, happen or realize the wavelengths in okay. the reality? So okay. we consult also the development. OK. Thank you. I think for the sake of time, we need to conclude here. Thank you very much, Say yeah. again. You're welcome. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you.